Uh, I have a teenager in my life who just joined residence at UVic and the residence coordinators had this thing where they were, they were like, if you quiet, this is silent coyote, everybody quiet. <laughs> I have a couple of housekeeping things to uh, talk about, actually more than housekeeping. Um, welcome everybody. I'm so thrilled. My name is Beth Stewart. I'm new, relatively speaking, new faculty here. I've been here for a year, but I'm uh, pretending that this is just the beginning. Um, and it's really lovely to see so many humans together thinking and talking and experiencing art. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's also, um, bear with us because we're, this is the first time that we're doing this in person with a hybrid on Zoom. So there's a lot of kind of technical uh, layers. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention um, before I welcome Sandra um, is that the library, Christine Wald has generously um, pulled together a number of uh, artist publications um, assembled via the UVic library and they're in the folios on the table as you go out and you are welcome to take one when you leave. They are for, for the taking. Swag. <laughs> um, so first and foremost, I want to um, acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. Um, I have been um, aware of and uh, thrilled to the nines by Sandra Meggs's work since I was introduced to it in graduate school too long ago to mention. Um, and uh, I feel a great amount of respect um, and, 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 and humility coming here after Sandra has left feeling in this department in, that I am feeling trying with with a brave heart to fill big shoes. Um, and, uh, and I, I, you know, like there, this is, it, this feels, this feels, uh, it feels really auspicious and generous um, to be called by the works that are present in the gallery right now. And by the, the depth and breadth of the publication that um, we are also here to celebrate. So without too much ado, I welcome the venerable, Sandra Banks. Hi, thank you all so much. And um, it's just awesome to be here and see all you lovely people and all the many people out there on Zoom who I can't see, but thank you for being there. Um, I, I want to first start by thanking Beth for being so generous in putting all of this together uh, pretty quickly and to being so welcoming to me and to Cedric Bomford for allowing me to visit and getting the funds together for that and the Department of Visual Arts and everyone here uh, where I had taught for uh, nearly 25 years and it's wonderful to be back. I want to thank Monroe's Books for being here and representing the book and ECW Press for publishing the book and the Canada Council who funded a very, very major portion of the book and putting it together. And it's uh, beautifully designed. There's a little um, separate story section in the middle with four little stories that I wrote. I'm going to talk about my work for about 40 minutes, just to introduce you if you're not familiar. But before I do that, I would like Helen, uh, I would like to introduce you to Helen Marzoff, the intrepid writer and curator. She was for many years, the executive director of Open Space in Victoria and she curated my exhibition of the basement panoramas in 2013, which was just a mega um, 
exhibition. And um, uh, Helen, come on up and say a few words about the book. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sandra. Thanks for all your help throughout this uh, process. As all of you who know Sandra well, you know that she's the best curator of her work. She's always uh, presented it most of the time in series and it's a whole installation. And um, I know that my experience with the basement panoramas was, um, you know, I just followed her lead. Anyway, um, I prepared a few remarks. I think I have five minutes, but they may go a little That's over right. five. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Teach your message. Okay, it's a good idea. Okay, is that a little bit better? Okay. Um, I thank all the same people that, that Sandra did, but I would also like to thank um, Laura Wilson, Heather Dean, and Christine Walsh um, from the University of Victoria Special Collections, um, who facilitated a lot of the research. Um, I'll chat briefly about the way I approach the essays and then highlight one of the ever present threads in Sandra's work that also animates the warblers. Um, Sandra set the structure in place for the book, giving me these four intriguing, irresistible chapter heads, um, the Gothic narrative through nature, or is it nature through narrative? Either way. Um, slapstick and other mysteries. And then finally, reckoning, awakening. And those chapters that she gave me kind of chapter heads uh, catalyzed how I approached her work. And I have a feeling, and I know actually from experience that artists are the best people to determine how their work is set up or discussed. They know it best. So I followed her lead and I also followed the way archiv archivists respect the way documents come to them. Recognizing that the way someone organizes their papers and their personal effects tells us a lot about how they see themselves, how they see their work, and how they see their obsessions. So since 2018, I've been spending a lot of time in the, the archives, the special collections at, uh, in the McPherson Library. And um, I was working on a short essay, um, an archive of a thousand questions, which is in the free um, pamphlet from, oh yes. Also beautifully designed by Rayola Creative. So, um, I have to admit that uh, before I started that project, I thought I knew a lot about Sandra's work, but um, I was just blown away by a lot of the things I encountered in those three bankers boxes. Um, there were drafts of short stories from the very beginning of her career, uh, journals, artist books, correspondence. There were a lot of surprises. There were a lot of artist books and, um, a lot of things, a lot of the correspondence, the breadth of what she brings to her work was just overwhelming. Again, I was really grateful for having those chapter headings <laughs> to help me. Um, and then I was really impressed by the fastidious preparation and research that goes into everything that she does. Um, the pandemic marked the, the book in a lot of ways. There were no studio visits and uh, traveling to see work in other collections wasn't possible. So looking back, I think there were some affinities between the archives and our much quieted COVID lives. Time slowed a little bit and there seemed to be a lot more of it. Um, as I looked at Sandra's work on the screen, it occurred to me that her work was about slowing time as much as anything else. Um, spending time with it more than the three second average accorded to each work of art if, that you, you see in an art gallery. Um, they made studies of how long people actually look. This slow time made her images seem even more compelling and active in my mind. Um, 
I looked at reproductions, websites, and online archives, and I talked to Sandra occasionally. She was always available, and she answered even the stupid, excuse me, the stupidest questions with real grace. Um, I snooped through a few books that seemed important to her, and I searched out accounts from curators and artists who knew her work firsthand in the 70s and 80s. There's a lot of fantastic and astute writing about Sandra's projects. I knew I could never match Nancy Towsley's play-by-play uh, -play of the newborn or Diana Nemiroff's unpacking of Strange Loop or how the theater critic Danny O'Quinn interpreted the little lost operas. So these voices and many others animate the essays too. And I hope readers will seek them out as well. Sandra always finds ways to connect. Various genres of humor leaven her project, projects, and cartoonish figures appear and reappear in her work, notably in her trademark minimalist faces that appear in so many of her works. Um, and they're, they're put together with just a few marks or a quick assemblage or an understated bas relief, and they're just suffused with emotion. In his new book about Looney Tunes, and I'm realizing probably a lot of you don't know what Looney Tunes were or are, um, they're in early 20th century uh, animated film shorts. Um, Bugs Bunny, Elmer Fudd, uh, Wile E. Coyote, you probably get the drift. Um, Jamie Wyman refers to the precision and timing and beautifully animated reactions of the characters of classic Looney Tunes Sandra's skill, still interlocutors reach towards us with the same kind of intensity a lot of times. In the Warblers, we join a group of small, demurely anthropomorphized paintings with jingling red alter egos that draw us into an interpretive spin, spin cycle. They look simple, but they're quietly disassembling both our, our expectations of an artwork and how we perceive it. So it was kind of, it was amazing to work with you. Just you. incredible. So thank you for listening. I'd like to introduce Christopher Butterfield who has collaborated with me on a number of works. Christopher is um, he's been teaching here for almost 30 years. He teaches composition in the, mu the um, School of Music. And the University of Victoria is really lucky to have him. And you students are really lucky to have him. And you should all take his classes when he's got room in them. Um, and I just wanted to ask. Christopher to come up and just talk a little bit about your ideas around collaboration and how you how you like to do that. Um, if you wouldn't mind. Hi. Um, Thank you, Sandra. Um, before I say anything else, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of part of the show down the road there. You may have seen it with the bells. Uh, before I do anything, I want to say thank you to Daniel Laskrin uh, in the visual arts department, who, without whom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I hope his reward will come before he gets to heaven. I'll, try, I'll work on that. Um, but if it, if it doesn't, you'll get it. In a <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, somehow, what do you want me to talk about? Uh, just our, our, our adventures. Our adventures, good, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, when you go along in life, um, you find yourself um, 
you don't realize at the time, but after years go by, you find that you're quite closely associated with somebody. Um, that would be her. Uh, and I sat there well, trying to remember the first thing we did together. Quant pour enfant passage, yeah. the drawings, yeah. really. Yeah. But that's only like 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 10 years ago. Or... Yeah, that's it. Oh, I thought we went back way further. <laughs> well, well, when was the basement? When was the basement panels? Oh, yes, maybe that's before. I don't know. I've been time mixed up, so maybe not. It doesn't matter anyway. Right. Anyway, we've done lots of stuff together. Um, and it's from I, I love collaborating with people and I've been I've worked a lot with dance um, and uh, I love working in visual arts. Um, I'll just put that in context a little bit. Um, I was a student here starting about 19 yonks. Um, uh, and in those days, this building didn't exist and the music school didn't exist. It was only the McLaurin building. And on one side of the hallway was the music department and the other side of the hallway was the visual art department. And so we just thought it was obvious that you just grow up playing music and being with painters and you know where that goes. <laughs> yeah, um, unfortunately it got separated over the years and I've always tried to be part of this world because I love it so much. And again, the people here have been kind enough to let me come and do it. So that leads to other things. Uh, and um, I, I've been able to do extraordinary things with Sandra. I've been able to sort of realize dreams that would be impossible in the music world. <laughs> But luckily, the visual arts world, if you get know, know the right people, have bigger budgets. So you can pull off stunts that you'd never be able to pull off otherwise. Anyway, this show down here, which I'm very happy to say seems to bring nothing but smiles to people's faces. And um, also, it's a speculative, I always do things in a kind of speculative way. So I make sounds, whether people play them or whatever, or they're on the wall spinning around or loudspeakers or whatever. It's always with the hope that something would, it would cause a, a reaction, cause an effect. I don't know what it is quite, you know. Um, but in this case, uh, it seems to be pleasure. Um, and the lovely thing about this show, and I'll give you a tip here. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but maybe on the way out, you can make sure that you look at the captions that are on the paintings and then look at the bells, right? They're going around and see how the bells set the captions to music. You know, we all know what a song is, right? Song has lyrics and so, well, there's the song and there are the lyrics. There's the music for the song. And it's lovely when you start to let your imagination sort of put those things together as a sort of soundtrack for the paintings themselves. And I didn't do that intentionally. I, I just didn't. You know, I said, I've got some bells. And Sandra said, that's neat. And I said, oh, I, I see them kind of going round and round. I said, good. And, and I thought, what, what does it all mean? Actually, what you hear is what it is. Oh, oh, I did that. Um, this was my studio in Victoria when I was making All to All. And this is my current studio in Hamilton when it was uh, pretty neat. It's not like that right now. Um, so this is my favorite quote I tell my first year painting students, a pair of socks is no less suitable to make a painting with than wood, nails, turpentine, oil, and fabric. You begin with the possibilities of the material. And I think that um, my art is as much about materiality as it is about form and color. And then obviously subject is there as well. Um, I wanted to show you this work from 1972 that I did 
in my first year of art school at the Rhode Island School of Design. I pulled 20 random color samples, went to New York, the fabric district, and tried to match each color sample to fabric. And then I sewed 20 identical dresses. And the result was a performative painting. So I placed the dresses in a pile, tried each one on, walked uh, some distance, removed the dress, and at the end, this was the result. I, I found this um, beautiful old theater being renovated and they let me use the space for the night. So it did have a balcony and everything. So it was very grand. So I'm going to start um, really showing you the last complete uh, completed exhibition that I did other than the Warblers, which is very brand new, the Little Lost Operas. Um, I opened this exhibition March 12, 2020, about three days before Toronto locked down. I felt really fortunate that I got to have the opening. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of walk you through it a little bit. Uh, this is the, what I call the title signed. And this is the installation. So there are maybe about 10, 10 of these little paintings. I have been fascinated with opera um, a really long time. And I, for a long time, subscribed to the Canadian Opera Company when I lived in Toronto. And I just loved having my own seat. I went and I could select four operas a season and I'd go. And it was just like such a conglomeration of many different things going on. Maybe you'd get your like 30 second thrill of the grand aria. And um, So you would take, the viewer would enter and take this uh, brochure that was on the cabinet and carry it around. And it had little um, captions for the individual panels. I'm going to show you two of them. This is called the seduction. So they all had a, a kind of puppet uh, main character. And then they had a little paper cutout that was a secondary character in a scenic painting behind them. And then they all had a um, weird fabric framey thing. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm only gonna show that one. Um, so the, um, oh, sorry, the, um, the, there were two vintage fans that kind of moved the fabric frames around, just like the curtain of, of the grand stage. I just wanted to read you one of the little texts so you got an idea. This is for the seduction, which is the painting that I showed you the video of. It's a hodgepodge of stuff I put together from various opera plots and music reviews. In the libretto, the young Carlos seduces the lovely Alice in a game of hide and seek in the garden. It is scored for three flutes, two oboes and English horns with a stunning diversity of rhythms melodic motifs and harmonic devices. The countertenor Carlos voices a sound that is otherworldly. What unfolds is a rich complexity full of playful joy. 
Alice is enthralled and falls to the rapture. Okay, so two days after the opening, the gallery was shut down and all the little operas were truly lost. And I brought the vinyl, I cut, I cut some of the characters out, had them enlarged in vinyl and I was offered this door by Susan Hobbs and, and put them right at street level. And it was just super fun. People really liked it. So um, now I'm jumping back to All to All. Um, all to All came right after the basement panoramas, which is all about grieving after my husband, uh, Paul passed away. And suddenly I felt revved up and happy to be alive. And I wanted to make a work that just embraced all of that. And really all to all is um, all about math, time and matter. So it's really a lot about physics. And I thought about it, I thought about the options as like this mathematical idea. Would you rather have none to none, all to none, none to all, or all to all. Of course, there's only one choice. <laughs> so um, this really was an extravaganza, 150 paintings on paper, 10 paintings on canvas on easels, six altered chiming clocks, six rotorized biscuit tins, 18 pieces of polymerized gypsum, six robotic figures, a wall painting, and a gong performance. So the first thing you did when you got into the gallery was ditch your ego. And you had either to ditch your grand large ego or your medium sized ego or your small ego. And they were all measured and weighed and stuck in the corner. And then you saw this. So um, this is all the stuff. And I do have a little video that's uh, the best way to sort of explain what was going on. Um, the, the bones and golden robes that you saw by the gong upstairs were reconfigured from the basement panoramas and made into these whirling dervishes. And the gong I performed every day at around lunchtime, maybe 15 minutes. And it really did bring all the matter to vibration and all the people to vibration. It went out onto the street and um, it, it was really very extraordinary. Um, so I wanted to show you this 150 paintings on paper. And this is one of the sculpture studios over there. I did much of this work here in the building in the summers when um, 
I was allowed to use some of the spaces. So the paintings on paper were all done randomly and then they were um, thoughtfully grouped into five and there were 30 and they're called the elevators. There were 30 forms of five. And I came upon this when I was reading about the number five and the form of the quincunx. So five is a very powerful number in many ways. It's a prime number, it's a Fibonacci number, and it's also very uh, important in nature in our own bodies with our digits and in um, natural forms. And the thing is that if you put five things together and there's a weakling, it doesn't matter anymore because they all help it along. So, uh, you know, they're very, very powerful. And for that reason, I call them elevators because they'll elevate you. And then there were 10 Tondo paintings that I called the mystics. And um, I'm not gonna show you all of them, but um, they were, I think on a journey. Uh, it was all about a journey into the universe in some way. Um, and then there were the uh, chiming clocks. They were, I just love the chiming clocks. I um, removed the hands, I painted the faces, different colors, and they all made different sounds. And they chimed uh, whenever they felt like it because uh, nobody knew what time it was. And it was really wonderful in the gallery. And then these rotating um, cookie tins had marbles or squash balls or I don't know, bits of wood and they just kind of clinked around. Yeah, so that was all to all. And uh, I wanted to, I showed this because the sound of the gong, which you can't get in a recording off a little computer like this, but it's almost identical to the NASA Space Voyager recordings, which is matter um, moving around. And if you think of it, an atom is really only 0.001% matter and the rest is space. And that's what the universe is like. And that's what we're like. And that's what the gong kind of means to me, I think. Okay, moving along. Um, I have had a collection of counter display mannequins from the 40s and 50s. I collect them. I love the gestures, the expressions, and the fact that when, when I was a child, um, they were on display in the women's departments of the fancy department stores. Something about the women, the womanness of them. I do have a couple men though that are very beautiful. They're quite rare, but they would uh, display uh, suits often. And it was in my browsing of these items to purchase on eBay or whatever that I found a vintage original glass ticker from the Netherlands. So these figures would sit inside a shop window and tap from the inside on the glass and entice customers inside. I, I acquired this boy and I had him 3D printed and, well, 3D scanned and then printed as a mirror image of himself. And I refer to him as the boy, not the boys. And that's very important because he's the same boy, even though he's two. And that's, this universe here that he inhabits. So it's not a slick thing or anything. It's just basically a theater set. And um, this is also a good little video to show so that you get what's going on kind of. That was the original guy. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, so you get that. Um, I wanted to show you, I also built him here and one of our fourth year undergrads, Zhao Zhu, she did so much work. She did the mechanization of him. Um, and she, she did so much work for me that summer. This just shows you how, how I was visualizing it. It was being built in the shop and I did the painting on paper and wrapped it around, played with the fabric. You know, that just kind of shows you how it was thought through. Um, yeah, so that's the glass ticker. So now I'm moving on to um, the room for mystics. Um, I was incredibly fortunate to win the Gershenitskivitz Prize at the AGO in 2015, um, right after All to All. And the wonderful thing about the prize was it not only included $50,000, but it included a solo exhibition at the Art Gallery of Ontario, which I had two years to prepare for. And I had just come off of um, All to All, and then I had even more ideas about how wonderful it is to be alive. And I began conceiving of the Room for Mystics. And very early on, I knew that it had to have sound. So I asked Christopher if he would collaborate with me and we began um, working together on it. This is our um, little scale model. Um, all of this work was done here in this space over two summers. Uh, this just gives you an idea of how you could possibly conceive of something like that. Um, you really need to understand the space. So we worked for quite a while without having been to the space. And then we were invited there from here to do a site visit to be in the space. And I think that was very important for Christopher because he could get an idea of how sound would function in it. And also I looked up and it had a ceiling higher than that above the skylight. And I immediately knew something had to go above it. And that's when I conceived of this um, mobile and also the banners because the walls are very high in there. Um, this was built again by Zhao Zhu. And this just shows you uh, this very simple construction. She came up with a, um, a balancing system and the little red mark. Um, oh, I can't use my cursor, I guess. This little red mark just shows you, that's a tiny little weight. It's all it took to balance it. So um, it's, it's very brilliant. Daniel also helped uh, conceive of the uh, construction of, of this. This is a um, site photo of the installation. So, um, Christopher decided where each speaker would go way ahead of time, according to that little scale model. All the speaker wire had to be laid and then the floor was placed on top of it. Um, amazing. Uh, just, this is uh, Christopher in his first rehearsal with the um, brass trio. I'm gonna show you a little clip of them playing in the space. So now I'll just take you uh, uh, through the show a little, little bit. 
Um, right in the middle um, here, this is a cabinet with the amplifiers. And these were um, speakers. Each A-frame had its own speaker box designed by Christopher. And the beautiful thing about that amplifier box was it was glowing. Honestly, these beautiful vintage um, glass tubes would glow red and people were drawn to it like as it was a fireplace or something. It was just amazing. And um, I'll show you a quick video. And this will have sound, although it probably won't be that good, but let's go, let's go. psychedelified up on that screen it's not like that on mine I don't know something with the wi-fi I think but um you you get you get the idea right I hope um and in addition to that music which is way more complex than it sounds on here because each of the speakers has its own sound as you walk around you hear something different and um, it's just absolutely mesmerizing. In addition to the recorded sound, there was a performance every day by the Vox Eris Trio in a composition that Christopher composed. And I have a video clip of them. So um, the AGO would not film them because they didn't want to pay them the royalty of the music things. So I kindly got their permission to make my own little crude video, which is, I, it's in slow motion so that I can extend, so that you can actually hear the, the piece, at least, at least uh, a section of it. So they began in the um, beautiful lobby on the main floor of the AGO, and then they would get in the elevator go up to the fourth floor and proceed. It was like a fanfare, really. It was really amazing.
Um, also, the space, I just wanted to say how performative and fun the space was. People were completely uninhibited in there. I think because the paintings were off the wall, they were very approachable. The speakers were kind of anthropomorphized. There were stools that people could move around and sit. And so I just pulled a few of the Instagram posts that pe I, I don't know these people, but they're on um, hashtag room for mystics. And um, this one on the right, there was a story in the Globe and Mail about this Italian young man who met the love of his life on internet dating. And he came to Toronto for the first time for their first date. And he brought her or she brought him, I guess, to the AGO. And then he proceeded to make this drawing of, of their first date. <laughs> but I think he did a whole series of all their things they did in Toronto that day. And um, I mean, people just did whatever they felt like. And some uh, teachers assigned the show to their students. And this, this painting on the top right is, is by an art student and she sent it to me. I think it's beautiful. And then there are lots of uh, young kids that would hang out in there. Um, yeah, I just threw in a few images of some of the paintings so you could kind of get the character of them. These were, I call them the, the love goddesses and um, spheres. This is a um, mitochondria from the body pumping energy. I did listen to a lot of uh, brass at the time. And I think when Christopher asked me what I had in mind in the very beginning, I just said brass. And I don't know, you said like, oh God. Yeah. <laughs> um, this was the very last, I have 30 paintings and this is the very last one. So I felt I had to thank all the colors and I thanked all the colors and all the colors said, you're welcome to me. And this was a grand painting, one of the largest ones that we used on the cover of the book. Um, I think that's it. I just wanted to show you some, um, how I conceived of the warblers in, this little tiny piece of paper that I think it was like, I didn't have much paper in the studio. So I would just use the same piece of paper for, I don't know, a few months. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would just sketch them out and then I would make them. Um, and I do feel that um, they are all about this gap, the gap between the painting and the viewer and the, the kind of tragic space there that you want to be with the painting. I do. And they wanted to be with me. So I tried to set that up and um, that was the result. Oh, I love this little video if you don't mind indulging me just for a second. This is the flap, making a flap is all. 
So I made all the flaps and then I, then I painted them and they're stuck in the holes in the things. So um, I think that's the last slide. And um, yeah, Christopher, Christopher and I then worked uh, from a distance again, um, through, throwing ideas around. And then he came to Hamilton, uh, showed me his bells and there it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's it for images. So do you, I don't know, I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> so Sandra. Yes. We could do this in a couple ways. We made an executive decision not to take questions from the folks that are on Zoom. Okay. But there's 40 of them, 40 plus of them out there. Um, yeah. And, uh, but it would be really, I think, great if we could take the questions that folks ask and um, say them again. No, you in, do that. I can okay. Do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you may, you're we, in charge. You're in charge. Okay. Big boss. You got to answer too, though. You got to answer. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> So we Just are. Don't, don't show everybody my screen. Okay. Put like a blank slide on or something. Or go full thing on that. I mean, my screen's uh, ugly. There. There we go. There. Thank you. So we're welcoming questions, folks. <laughs> Rick Leon. So can you talk a little bit about um, what of your work is like theater and opera and different elements? And collaborating with other people. Do you, um, you have you a collaborating with you know, having a kind of a collection? Yep. So, uh, the question was around uh, working through um, theater and music and painting and um, and collaboration, the ideas of disciplines collaborating and also um, collaborations with, with other artists. And Rick asked whether or not Sandra felt that uh, she was, the process of painting itself was like a collaboration. I definitely am with you there. I, I view the painting as my mate and we have struggles together and um, we work together. I have to listen to the painting and then the painting has to shape up like, like I tell it to, you know? Um, yeah, definitely, uh, I, I, lo I love that. I love that part of it. But also, I also feel there's another collaborator which is the viewer. So the viewer is very abstract, I don't, I don't have a person in mind. I mean, maybe at one point it was a special boyfriend or something, but I don't have that now. So um, I think it's like an abstraction of the person that I'm not something like that. And then the painting and the viewer, they have another collaboration, which I think is a lot in the warblers, what they're more about than maybe more directly than, than other works. Yeah, you're welcome. I'd like to talk about the dress the serial being around the book or series. Um, and um, sometimes art like this aspect of music where there is no narrative or representation in this music is that emotional and so saturated public your paintings and that's what it's okay with that. Um, but I was wondering if you thought about the series, the repetition of an image or work of the idea with the stock firing on recorded music. With the, say the last part of, about music? That it's recorded and um, the repetition is stock piled to the music and kind of levels the relationship between the series. Right. 
and reported them for an assessment. Um, so the question was around a relationship between seriality or the painted series and um, collecting or stockpiling music, recorded music. You mean, uh, I, do you get it? Yes. So I think if I understand correctly, the question is around when you record music, you don't, it's not, it's not as if you just record once. Although sometimes you would do a live recording, but. Okay. Well, why are you? Well, I want to get the music part. What, why did you abandon that? Because the music is, uh, you forget the music recording all the time. Right. That, uh, Maybe something is uh, lost somehow, or uh, okay. there's an aspect of our culture that stops by things that are recorded. I kind of get it. Okay. Okay, I, I I'll go I'll go with what I think or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I, I do get stockpiling. I mean, of course, when you get a subject you want to explore. You want to stockpile more and more things about it. Like you want to do more. Well, but you need a structure. So I often say to myself, okay, I'm going to do 10 uh, operas. I think that's my limit. I can't, I can't do more because it's so grand. It's absolutely grand. So anyway, I get the structure. I work in a series, I set out a structure. If I'm going to do all to all, I do like a million things. If I'm going to do little lost operas, I do 10 things. Um, it's been always the way I worked. If somebody said to me, I want to put a painting in the show, can you do a painting? I can't do it. I just have no idea what to do. Like, what do I put in that painting? I, I don't, what would it be about? You know, I have to do a lot to get to, to, get to it. I think you kind of work through the subject in that way. I don't know if that if that answers your question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. But I would say that in terms of your work, you're making material not because you need an army of them. It's evident that you're working from that. Yeah, that's right. Hopefully, or not. Whatever you work through it, or you try anyway. <laughs> Yeah, it makes me just think about relationships between albums and playlists and yeah and iterative kind of recordings and versions and and I think interestingly uh, in some ways from exhibition to exhibition or project to project you do something like all of those things you know right. in 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 different moments. Yeah, you did a master's degree in philosophy. I did. And I'm curious, like I said, it's, it's okay. I'll... I'm curious, what made you choose philosophy to do a master's degree? And what do you think what you got from it that changed your work the most? Okay, so the question was, Sandra, thanks. You had done a master's degree in philosophy. And, oh, and I just lost it. And what was it about that de degree in philosophy that um, influenced you the most? Is that the? Why, why did you do it? And what do you think you brought with you? So why did you do it? And what, what did you bring with you to the practice? Um, I studied art at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in the 1970s. And at that time, everything was about art theory. And I mean, people were very serious about um, Wittgenstein and um, Foucault. And it was, I mean, I, I'm sure it wasn't just there, it was everywhere, it was in the air. And then I realized um, everybody was reading Wittgenstein in Art Forum magazine 
And I, I didn't understand it. Like, what is this language? And I really, really wanted to. Um, so I got my BFA and then I went to um, Dalhousie to, to study philosophy. And Dalhousie did teach analytic philosophy and I did take courses on Wittgenstein and um, it was very, very analytic. And then I went back and read the articles in our forum and I realized it's just complete gibberish and nobody knows what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> but um, it was at the same time, it was important to me. And I loved, um, I loved Wittgenstein's ideas. I mean, I'm just using him as one example, but um, it gave me a love for thought and reading and carefully thinking through what things mean. So I became very interested actually in epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. How do we know things? And then I um, went and I spent a half a year in Berlin and became immersed in ideas in the Frankfurt School, which was completely the opposite of the analytic uh, education that I had gotten. But those two things were wonderful to, to have known about. And I think all of that really did um, <clears throat> enliven. <clears throat> First of all, it gave me confidence to um, pursue ideas and, and to pursue reading and really, really, really appreciate it. And then it just kind of started filtering into my work in um, my interest in critical, being a critical person in the world as artists are, I think. Um, so it was very, very important to me. I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, disciplines that artists go off and do that are bring different things to, to their art. And I think for me, that was really important. I lost my order. I'll go Todd, Liam, human, I'm not sure the name of, and Kosar. Okay. <laughs> so Todd. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, Sandra, if you could talk a little about how your work uh, deals with attraction and repulsion for some of the issues through the use of forms of color, um, complementary color, as well as some of the capacity of Sound the glass picture, particularly ideas of color, this idea of kind of uh, inviting the viewer to the work, but at the same time putting the viewer back on the field. Okay, that's a good one. So the question was around attraction and repulsion um, in relation to discordant and uh, complementary color, and also. Uh, aspects of horror, particularly uh, in works such as The Glass Ticker? Um, that's a really good question. I think it's, it's kind of hard to answer, but um, I think um, I know The Glass Ticker really, really terrified a lot of people when they saw it for the first time. Uh, I just thought it was hilarious. Um, so I, then I had to kind of rethink through like, oh, what is this thing that I made? I mean, it's not like Chucky or something, but um, I found him very adorable. So it surprised me and it made me think about my work. Um, I mean, I think, um, you know, sexual attraction is like that. You, you become fascinated by someone for both reasons, and that draws you more. I mean, maybe that's perverted, I don't know, but um, I think for sure art does attract, obviously you want it to attract people, but um, you also want it to challenge them. And I think it's like maybe more about challenging, but um, I mean, it's not all like that. I think the Room for Mystics was um, not, didn't have that element. I think it, it varies from piece to piece, but I definitely do have, um, if I'm doing something that I think is funny, there will usually be an element of perversity in it somehow. And I think if you read some of the short stories in the book, you'll kind of get it because my childhood was a lot like that. 
I don't know if that makes sense. But. Also, I think the book lady wants to go soon. So maybe that we will limit it to those questions left. Sure. Okay. Yep. Liam? Liam? I just have a general question about the point in your work. And if you're just referring to the kind of there's a little awful. And I was just being curious about the, where that comes from in my career. Oh, it's kind of a little bit of a And where, where you discover these moments in the book from, how you navigate that, how that also shows you what it's like. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is around um, humor and where the transcendental comedy in the work comes in. I mean, what is transcend transcendental? Um, definitely a gong performance is transcendental. I think maybe the little seduction opera painting can you can transcend through that to something weird and uh, wonderful. Um, I think weird and wonderful is transcendental. And I think art is all like that. And I think that's the beauty of art is it takes you somewhere that you weren't expecting to go and that you don't even understand. And um, I, I love that. I mean, the thing is though, you can't you can't force that. Like, I can't go to the studio and say, oh, I'm gonna make something transcendental today. That's why you have to be so engaged and deep embedded in what you're doing. And through that, I think we all feel it as artists, is, is that um, you don't make it happen, it, it just happens. No, I mean, um, I think for me, humor has been a way of coping. I mean, in my, I was very aware of that writing the stories in my childhood. It was just a way of coping. And um, I mean, I know scenes from my life can be described as grotesque and told with, as a joke at the same time. And that's a way of coping. Um, yeah. I. I guess, I, I forget where I was going with that, but it's a bit too much, I think. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I had a question about, so like for your exhibitions that were designed to do a lot of materialized classes. Um, how much would you say the show is individual pieces that are assembled to bring message? And how much of it is like part of the same work that you're visiting? Um, so, for instance, like in your room for mystics, um, each piece, do you feel like they were individuals that assembled under a common cause, or do you think that they are each piece is more like a limb that you can visit as the same purpose? Um, I was in love with each painting as I did it. Definitely, it was a discreet thing to me. Um, it is kind of heartbreaking to me that I don't think the show will ever be redone. It's just too dispersed now and everything like that. So, I mean, the thing is it has two, it has both things to it. And um, I guess that's just the way it has to be. Sometimes I will have a show, like the Little Lost Operas are wonderful together but it's a commercial gallery. And if, if somebody wants to buy one, they're gonna be separated. Uh, that's just the way it is. I just have to like live with that, you know? You can't, you can't trud, trudge everything around with you. I mean, I could, but it would all go to a bonfire at the end. So better to get it out there. <laughs> okay, so. Kosar has forfeited uh, her question. Okay. It can it could happen at another time. Um, thank you so much, Sandra. You're welcome. It's, it's great been a to real be pleasure. Thank you.
the gallery is going to be open for a little bit and the books are still available for sale. Thank you all so much.